Real gases, deviations from ideality. In this video, we'll identify how real gases differ from ideal gases and under what conditions gases are most likely to act ideally. We'll then introduce an alternative equation for gas calculations that you can use when gases aren't quite ideal or if you just need a better estimation of the parameters that we've talked about in the ideal gas law. So first, let's remember what we're talking about when we say ideal gases so we know when that those assumptions aren't true. So ideal gases assume that we have no attraction between molecules, so the molecules are not interacting at all. They also assume that they have no volume. So we call this a point mass. It has mass, but no volume. This is true for some conditions, but not for other conditions. You may want to give this video a pause and think about when this is true and when this isn't true. Think about when molecules are most likely to attract each other or and when molecules volume makes more of a significant difference than at other times. When molecules are moving really quickly, attraction is going to be negligible. They aren't going to interact with each other all that much. Now, if you slow them down, then attraction starts becoming more apparent. Then there's time for the molecules to interact with each other as they move by each other. The kinetic energy isn't outweighing that. So let's think about when that would be, under what conditions that's not gonna be negligible anymore. Well, when are molecules moving very slowly? Think about how temperature is related to speed. How is mass related to speed? How do intermolecular forces relate to attraction? So given all of these sort of hints, at low temperatures, high masses, and high intermolecular forces, the attraction becomes a much larger aspect of the gases' properties. So these are the three situations where you would have to be watching out for a gas being not ideal. Low temperatures, high masses, and if there's very high intermolecular forces. Now let's talk about the volume issue here. So in ideal gases, volume is negligible. What this really means is that you have so much space in between the molecules that that space is very large in comparison to the space of the actual molecule. So the molecules are taking up very little space. When is that not going to be true? Well, at very high pressures, you're going to start compacting the molecules. And now suddenly, maybe before the molecules only made up 1% of the space, but at really, really high pressures, now the molecules are making up almost all of the space. I like to compare this to putting people in a classroom and say, okay, if I put one person in a lecture hall, you know, that's only less than 1% of the volume. And we could say that that person's, that person's volume doesn't much matter in that room. But now if we were to fill that lecture hall that normally can only hold 400 people with 1,200, 12,000 people even, and just stack them all in, now suddenly that's becoming a huge portion of that lecture hall's volume. And so therefore now the volume of the people are 90% of the lecture hall, as opposed to a very small amount. The same thing is true with molecules. Compression factor gives us a measure of how ideal a gas actually acts. And a perfectly ideal gas would have a compression factor of one. So here we have a graph where this black line or the x-axis would represent the compression factor one or a perfectly ideal gas. And then we can look at these deviations and see where does it skew out very far from normal. Now it is worth noting here that these are very very high pressures in this graph. So over here there's sort of an inset of the graph just taken from this little section where the atmospheres go from zero to 10. So that's why the graphs look so different. They're just very different scales. What this compression factor actually is, is it's the actual volume, if you were to measure it, divided by the volume of what an ideal gas would be. Molecules are gonna attract each other when they are near to each other. So when they're close, they start to interact with each other, they start attracting each other. Now, if they become really, really close, and so close that now the electron clouds are starting to interact, now they start repelling each other. They start pushing away from each other because those two electron clouds don't really want to bump into each other. So that's why we get these different patterns here. 
Now, the more that it deviates from one, the less ideal the gas is. We can look at this and we can say, oh, hydrogen, which is very small and doesn't have a lot of intermolecular forces at the normal temperature or the normal pressures that we're used to dealing with it at, it's very close to ideal. Something like CH4, which is quite a bit bigger, starts to deviate from ideality. It's pretty big compared to hydrogen. And so because of that, you get this kind of sloping downward as you move away from low pressures. So again, this is still relatively high pressure when it comes to talking about um, atmospheric conditions. You can see at atmospheric conditions, most of these are pretty close to one. Ethene, and it too gets bigger. And so because of that bigger, you get even more deviations. Now, if we look at NH3, NH3 has also intermolecular forces. Since NH3 has dipole-dipole forces in hydrogen bonding, you get this very large deviation from ideality because they're actually gonna be trying to interact with each other quite a bit. And so that's why you get such a difference for NH3 as opposed to all the other ones. Now let's, how, now let's talk about how we deal with it when we are dealing with a gas that isn't acting ideally. So to do that, there's several different equations and several different methods that they have for dealing with it. The most common one and the simplest one and the one that we're gonna learn is the Van der Waals equation. What this equation does is it, put two, it puts two correction values on the equation, the ideal gas equation. So we can sort of recognize the ideal gas equation in here. We have PV equals NRT. But now there's, a, there's an additional term added to the pressure. And that just corrects the pressure a little bit. And there's this additional term subtracted away from the volume. That corrects the volume term a little bit. And so these corrections allow us to get a more accurate measurement or a more accurate calculation of what we could expect that gas to have. Now, we know what N and V are. Those aren't any different than before. But notice we have two new terms. We have A with B. So A and B are experimental values. Someone has done the experiment, they have calculated out what makes this fit the best, and those are in tables. You would never be asked to memorize this. You would always be given the A and B values if I asked you to use the Van der Waals equation. There are other equations for this. We're not gonna learn any of them, but you should be aware that if you were in higher level chemistry classes and or doing actual experiments and you needed a better way of estimating what your pressures and volumes and, and temperature changes are gonna be, there are other methods for accounting for ideality which are even more accurate. Now let's do an exercise using these principles that we've learned. So a sample of methane gas is at 50 degrees Celsius and 20 atmospheres. Would you expect it to behave more ideally or less ideally if the pressure were reduced to one atmosphere? So we're at a relatively high pressure, consider, or com at least compared to atmospheric pressure, and we're gonna reduce the pressure. If we're reducing the pressure, we're giving more space in between the molecules, and so that makes everything just a little bit more ideal. And so by reducing the pressure, we make it more ideal. Now, what if we reduce the temperature down to negative 50? So now we're taking it and we're making it quite cold. So think about what that does to the molecules. It's going to slow the molecules down. And if you're slowing the molecules down, now they have more time to interact with each other. And since they have more time to interact with each other, those we're going to have a deviation from ideality, or we're going to move away from being an ideal gas because of those extra interactions that are occurring. So that's a very conceptual way of talking about ideal gases. We can also do some calculations thanks to the Van der Waals equation that we have. So here we have the Van der Waals equation from the previous slide. And we can take and fill in the information I have here and look up a little bit of additional information and come up with an answer for this that's even better than if we use the ideal gas law. Now, if you're looking at this and you're saying, well, how would I know in this case to use the Van der Waals equation and not the ideal gas equation? I would have to give you some hint. I would give you some, some indication that I want a more accurate answer. And of course, in real life, you would know because you would know how accurate you need your answer to be and you would know what to do about that. So let's start here. First step we need to do is look up our A and our B values. At that point, it kind of becomes what we call a plug and chug equation. We just fill everything in. But let's look up our A and B values. So when we do this, we see that A is equal to 
and we see that B is equal to 0 0.0237. And at that point, we can fill everything in and solve as needed. And this is one of those equations where it actually is a little bit easier oftentimes to fill in and then rearrange, and so that's how I'm going to do it. So we can get that far with everything and fill in our NRT. And remember, we have to fill in our T in Kelvin. I'll do a little bit of the algebra out for you. So you can see how I typically do it. Of course, you're welcome to do it in whichever manner you like to get our answer. So now we've talked about how ideal gases and real gases actually differ from each other and under what conditions that gases are not going to act ideally. And maybe the ideal gas law isn't the best situation um, to use. We also learned an alternative equation for gas calculations that we can use in situations like this that account for deviations from ideality by using experimentally determined constants.